food. We all need it, we all love it. Whether it's a sensory culinary experience or just refueling to get you through your day, food is an essential factor in all our lives. But have you ever wondered how our food will look in the future? I'm John Watt, and this week we're taking food out of the restaurants and supermarkets and into the lab to see what happens when science becomes the new cook in the kitchen. We've arrived at Plant and Food Research to meet a neuroscientist, Dr. Arjan Shapens. Arjan is a senior researcher in their Mood Food Program, food that goes above and beyond the nutritional call of duty. I'm Arjan Shapens. I'm a senior scientist here at Plant and Food Research, and I run the Mood Food Program. The mood Food is a functional food, so a food that has an activity over and above its nutrition value, and that has a specific health benefit. Probably the best and most well known is caffeine. People feel down or tired and they, they choose to take caffeine and they can feel a benefit, they can feel a difference. One of the things we're aiming to do is pretty much the opposite of a caffeinated drink. We've asked people, we've gone to consumers and said, what do you want out of a functional food? And overwhelmingly people have said, we want something that calms us down. We want something to relax at the end of the day. The uniqueness of, of our products is that they are uh, New Zealand made, New Zealand designed from New Zealand crops and it's all about adding value to our horticultural exports. We're very interested in berry fruit, dark coloured fruit, raspberries, black currants, blueberries. These have some quite powerful chemicals in them, very, very healthy, very loaded with vitamins. Arjun wants to create a drink to help you to relax and to focus at the same time. To do this he isolates certain active compounds in New Zealand berries and then puts them to the test in clinical trials. But the challenge Arjan faces is, how do you measure a person's stress levels and their concentration levels at the same time? Arjan overcame this hurdle by designing a complex set of psychometric tests. These psychometric tests are specially designed to stress the test subject out. All right, John, well, I'd like to put you through your paces and let you have a go at some of these psychometric tests. In this test, any time I see three consecutive odd numbers or three consecutive even numbers, I've got to hit the space bar. These tests throw up challenges thick and fast. Well, oh, this is actually quite hard. That was wrong. It gets you when the word and the colour are the same. It's certainly designed to stress you out. So here's my mood food. I don't know if this is the actual food or if it's a placebo, but I'm going to take it and see what it does to my cognitive function and my stress levels. Right, here we go again. All right, John, how did you go? No, it was intense. I did feel less stressed the second time around. So let's find out from Arjam what his trial results are showing so far. This particular product, we've shown that it, it helps people relax um, to, to a degree if they're stressed. If they're not stressed, um, it has little effect, which is exactly what we want because that uh, prevents uh, any kind of abuse or habituation. And that if we give people a very challenging set of, of tasks, um, they do better at the tasks, they perform better at the tasks, and they feel a lot less mentally fatigued at the end of the tasks. Um, so that, that's a great consumer benefit. From berries that have mental benefits to berries that have physical benefits. We're going to have a look at some research that's discovering previously unknown health benefits of the humble, New Zealand grown black currant. My name's Roger Hurst. I'm the science group leader for the Food and Wellness Group, which is part of the food innovation portfolio at Plant and Food Research. Black currants, like all berry fruit, um, are well regarded to be high in health promoting uh, compounds, phytochemicals, and they're well known really to have antioxidant ability. Part of Roger's research is to examine how the antioxidants can help with muscle recovery. I'm going to drink the black currant juice and then undergo two types of exercise. The first is squats. This is designed to put stress on my body and create long-term muscle damage. The sort that makes your muscles feel sore for days. I can feel the sweat already. I'm not quite sure that nanoparticle research has quite prepared me for this. Am I turning red? Because this is hard. <clears throat> Next I undergo a rowing exercise which creates oxidative stress, which means free radicals enter my body through oxygenation, outnumbering the antioxidants in my system, causing cell damage. 
Straight after the exercise, I'm off for a blood test, which looks for markers of the oxidative stress and indicators of how serious the muscle damage was. And no, that didn't hurt a bit. Now we've got your sample and we'll pop this in the centrifuge. The principle of a centrifuge is to separate heavier and lighter components. So it's sitting in a rotor that's angled outwards and spun at high speed. And the process of that will push down the heavier particles and the lighter areas will stay up. My plasma has been tested to determine how effective the black current compounds are at preventing muscle damage and oxidative cell damage. We look at plasma as this is where the compounds are located. We were surprised by the data, honestly. Um, <laughs> Um, it's quite exciting. We got a very positive result for the, the study that we did with black current. The evidence indicates that um, consuming the black current in those situations gave a two-pronged benefit. One was um, controlling the oxidative stress mediated by the exercise. The other was reducing the muscle damage that occurred. It was minor muscle damage, but it was reduced. And the other one um, was assisting the, the natural immune and inflammation responses that occur through exercise. But that's not all. Roger's also looking at the very real benefits that these magical berries may have for asthma sufferers. We've chosen asthma as uh, an inappropriate inflammation condition because um, it's quite nicely defined. Asthma is an allergy type situation, so in a sense, this sort of work could easily indicate that it's applicable to other types of allergies. We think that there is potential in the future that we could create foods that consumers could have for people that suffer from asthma that um, will assist and alleviate some of the symptoms of asthma and help them with their normal treatments, that they, the drugs that they receive from, from the pharmacist. I'm an asthmatic myself, but hopefully in the future I'll be able to drink some of this and use less of this. And that's a good prospect. It has long been known that milk is a wonderful, nutritious food. Mother's milk is our first food source as a baby. And after this great start, most of us continue to drink milk for the rest of our lives. Fonterra, home of the New Zealand dairy industry. They've been testing some amazing compounds found in milk that may have far-reaching benefits in the future for cancer sufferers around the world. I'm Jeremy Hill. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Fonterra. Milk's the first uh, uh, form of food that all mammals have, humans have. It, it's, it's designed, if you want, to be nature's perfect food. It's full of literally thousands and thousands of different components. Many of those have specific properties. Uh, that Once you isolate them from, from milk itself, they can do rather remarkable things. Cancer patients often suffer from the terrible side effects of chemotherapy. So what is Fonterra developing that could make a difference? Well, we've developed a, a new product called Recharge, which is an ice cream that can be used to attenuate the side effects of chemotherapy. I guess we all have friends and relatives who've gone through a chemotherapy and we all know about the cytotoxic effects that these drugs have. We wanted to come up with a product that could reduce the suffering of people undergoing chemotherapy. Essentially what happens under chemotherapy is, is all rapidly growing cells are susceptible to attack by the chemicals. And what we've been able to do is formulate a combination of these compounds from milk that helps protect against the loss of those um, gut cells and blood cells whilst uh, the chemotherapy has been undertaken. Pretty amazing. So how did Fonterra go about discovering the bioactive compounds in the milk? Here in Palmerston North, Fonterra has the largest and most comprehensive dairy plant in the world. It's vital I follow their very strict hygiene rules to make sure I don't carry any bacteria with me into the plant. So what we've got here is ultrafiltration. It's like a giant sieving process. And we can separate those particles using sieving actions. What we've got coming out of here is whey. So once we've separated the whey, the proteins pass through this uh, material. So everything else washes through. And the specific protein that we're interested in binds very tightly to the column and end up with a very concentrated form of that protein. So the active ingredients in Recharge are made up of two separate compounds. One is a protein extract and the other a milk fat extract. But here's the problem. How do you separate these specific compounds from the thousands of other compounds found in milk? What we've got to be able to do is separate those proteins and then work out what they are. And then from that, to try and predict what they might be useful for. You've got all of these different proteins present in milk. And we put a charge on those proteins and then we can separate those proteins in an electrical field dependent upon their charge and their size. 
They're actually invisible, and this is one of the real challenges. So we've developed systems to actually bind dyes to those proteins so that we can actually see those proteins. And what we've got here is one of those gels that has been stained with the dye. Now, each of those bands that you see there isn't an individual protein. So the next thing we can do is to essentially take one of those gels, turn it on its side, and repeat that process. Once the protein in the gel has been stained, it's scanned into the computer for further analysis. Patients undergoing chemotherapy often lose their desire to eat due to the massive stress chemotherapy puts on their bodies. So how are Fonterra going to deliver this new medicinal miracle food? What could be better than ice cream? And who better to make it than New Zealand's favourite ice cream maker, Tip Top? A couple of scientists came up and said, look, we've, we've got some great research um, and we're looking at the side effects of, of, of chemotherapy. And could you possibly make it in ice cream? Um, and we was like, oh, ice cream? Could, yeah, absolutely, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a go. Probably the biggest difficulties in recharge were actually incorporating the ingredients. One of the ingredients is a protein. This protein in particular actually denatures when you heat it up. So we were playing around in the lab and thinking, oh, this could be relatively easy. We'll just make it like, a, like an ice cream. And we did that and essentially we blew our pasteurizer in our pilot plant because it went so very, very thick. Tip Top's big problem was when they heated up the protein, they destroyed its active components. But if they didn't heat it up, the protein powder stayed on top, making it incredibly difficult to mix with the other ingredients. So an ice cream mix usually would take, say, an hour or so to process. It took us about 14 hours to process this mix, actually manually mixing it by hand so you can actually get it into solution um, and, and make an ice cream out of it. So we had to make sure that it was absolutely micro-stable, so we were dressed up to, like, like little stormtroopers, gloves, masks, everything. After 14 hours of back-breaking hand mixing, Recharge was ready for the clinical trials. Yeah, it's actually really good. So what are the results so far? Well, the research is at an extremely exciting stage now. It's basically recharging the body, or fortifying um, the patient's body um, against the effects of chemotherapy. I mean, we're now undergoing clinical trials throughout New Zealand. There are 200 patients involved in that trial. It will take us uh, some time to complete, so more than a year out before we'll know whether the trial has been successful. This recharge product is unique and it's the first time that a, that, uh, a medical food has been based on ice cream uh, and there's been media coverage all around the world and, and people are very interested. We could potentially blend these particular components into a whole range of different foods, be they dairy or non-dairy foods. It doesn't necessarily even have to be a dairy food. What's really unique is we've taken the world's best dairy science here in you know, little old Palmerston, North New Zealand, and we've combined that with the world leading expertise we have in uh, medical research in Auckland University, put those together to create what is a world leading product and opportunity that could have enormous benefits to the population. But what if the future of foods isn't just about finding out new ways that the foods we already know and love can be of better benefit to us? What if the future lies in knowing ourselves so well, knowing our very genetic makeup, so that we can match foods to specific individual nutritional needs? What if the future is nutrigenomics? I'm now at the University of Auckland School of Medicine where I'm about to meet Professor Lynn Ferguson. Lynn works in the field of nutrigenomics and she's going to introduce us to the incredible world of the genome and what it can teach us about our food choices, health and well-being. I'm Lynn Ferguson and I'm Head of Nutrition at the University of Auckland. And my field of interest is a new field called nutrigenomics. Nutrigenomics is basically the study of gene-diet interactions. And the way we're using it is to think about how we can understand people's genes and optimise their diet to maintain optimal health. Cancer, cardiovascular disease, even slowing the progression of ageing are all likely to have some sort of genetic component that's going to optimise uh, nutrition in different ways for different people. So how does Lynn determine an individual's specific dietary needs? First comes an interview with a nutritionist. So what would be the first thing that you have to eat? I have two slices of toast yeah. with marmite. And what kind of bread would you use for your toast? Uh, like a multigrain or a rye. And do you have anything to drink with your breakfast? Yeah, I'll make up a smoothie with banana in it and a spirulina. 
we know that people sometimes like to think a little bit optimistically. They'll forget the chocolate bar and, and perhaps remember a little more of the vegetables than they actually ate. Lynn's given me a buckle swab so I can give her a sample of my DNA. So uh, let's get scraping. The buckle swab is to gather cells from the inside of my mouth. These cells can then be used to extract my DNA in order to build a picture of my genome or unique genetic portrait. To me it's really exciting that New Zealand is being seen as at, at the forefront of this field. We were in there right at the beginning. It was such a, a, a very potent collaboration, everyone ranging from dietitians, pathologists, bioinformaticists, geneticists. It's got enormous potential. It, it's moving fast and we really are up there with the rest of the world, if not ahead of them. Everybody isn't individual, but there are groups of people. And again, that seems to relate to the genotype data, where, where we're recognising that there's a group of people that are affected in immune response. There's a group of people that have got effects in, in transporter mutations. And so there's probably between three and five different groups of people genetically, and they're probably the same groups of people that, that have got different types of dietary requirements. At the moment, we don't know enough about gene-diet interactions to really be able to utilise the full potential of the field. But um, in 10 years' time, I think it's really going to be a matter of, of days or weeks so you can get whole genome information. That means you can go into the supermarket, swipe your barcode, and, and it'll signal the rows that have got the foods that are optimised for your genotype and again, really keep you in good health for as long as possible. So there's a good chance in the not so distant future we'll all be grocery shopping with our very own unique to us genome profile cards which will guide us to buy specific foods for our individual health needs. And if this all sounds very space odyssey and futuristic then brace yourself for a food type that's pushing the science envelope out even further. We're here at Massey University in Palmerston North to meet Professor Richard Archer, head of the Institute of Food Nutrition and Human Health. Most of the world's food at the moment is being quite highly processed and you can see the big counter trend which shows up as natural and organic and local and what people tend to call real food. What's the counter trend going to look like to natural and all things good? Well it's going to be artificial and it's going to be fast and it's probably going to be highly technological so coin this concept techno foods and it'll be a completely different food, nothing that we know at the moment. So it's not going to be a carrot, not going to be a vegetable, it won't be a pizza, it's not a burger, it's, it's nothing recognisable at the moment. It can be any colour, it can be any flavour, and you build up a food. So your food just exists in software before you make it. Because this food is constructed from scratch, nutritional elements can be added to the batter, creating a food that is customised for the user. We can inject multiple things into the food stream as we're building it up. It's perfectly placed for the nutrigenomic revolution. But how is this techno food put together? We have elected to go for something which is starch based or starch and polysaccharide based, which will then cook up to be a crumb structure, so bread like or muffin like or a solid foam basically. This is about food construction, so uh, unlike a bread where you've got a bit of leeway, we need to be able to predict the structure of the food absolutely, how it behaves when it's a paste and how it behaves during cooking. About 70% of a bread is air and we want to control the air because it's going to affect the printing process. So there's two issues, there's how it works in the printer but it also it's got to produce a food with a great texture, with something that people will like to eat. Fascinating stuff, but what is this food going to look like? What's this impressive piece of kit, Grant? All right, this here is a Thraxes Cartesian robot. That's the actual food printer. It can move um, two-dimensionally, like your standard printer that you'd print on two-dimensional bits of paper, but it's also got the Z-axis movement, which brings it up and we can sort of print three-dimensional objects with it. We've got an IV hospital bag full of uh, food batter. It comes down through here, through, this is a peristaltic pump, which is run off this step motor here. And it comes down through and out through a mixing chamber here. Also around here is where the colours will be injected from, from this piece here. And this here has the four syringes that will inject the colours to give you a full colour printed image. 
It's a bit like being a chef, but, <laughs> yes. but more science. With the batter all printed out, it's time to cook it and put it to the test. Ever wondered what constructed food tastes like? Teresa, this tastes like nothing. Well, it's meant to taste like nothing. The whole point of it being neutral is so people can choose what tastes they want to put in it. That's what makes it a personalised food. So what, what can you put in? What kind of taste can you put into this? Well, anything. I don't know. F fish? Chocolate? <laughs> raspberry? No limitations at all? No, uh, hopefully no limitations. That's definitely part of the project as well. Very good. Some taste would be good. <laughs> Who's going to want to eat this food and, and why? I think for a start it's going to be the young people. It'll be people looking for a, a, a new experience, something where the flavours are unusual and loud. The colours might be unusual and loud. When we started this it was a unique idea. I hadn't heard it anywhere else in the world. Um, since then we've heard the concept from a couple of places, but just as the concept, as far as I know, we're the only people really trying to put it into practice. You think the Jetsons uh, or Star Trek with a little oven that sits there and you dial up the food that you want. It's really about choice, about constructing foods. What's the new fast food? And I think this could be it. Science continues to discover more and more benefits in the food around us, which could lead to an evolution of diet for coming generations. That's all for this show. If you enjoyed the science and you want to find out more, visit the Ever Wondered website. See you again next time.